Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is um, GoToMeeting uh, 2, uh, as we do every other week uh, on the GoToMeeting series. Uh, we hear a message from one of God's elders in the church. Uh, today, we'll be hearing from our elder uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana, Steve Durham, and he'll be bringing a message uh, to us this morning. And I'll let Steve introduce his message, and so I will present to you Steve Durham. Well, good morning, everyone, and good evening for those in uh, Australia and New Zealand and <clears throat> on the other side of the world. <laughs> it certainly is an amazing uh, opportunity and technology that we had to be able to broadcast and talk to one another real time <clears throat> around the world. If you turn to Matthew 25, Matthew 25, Christ gives at the end of his Olivet Prophecy, uh, which is sort of the tail end of uh, the question that the apostles ask him about what the signs of the time, the end of the age would be. He, he throws in this uh, comparison between the sheep and the goats, the sheep and the goats. So today I wanna to talk about what are and who are the sheep and the goats of Matthew 25. Uh, it's just a little section at the end, uh, in the middle, stuck in the middle of Matthew 25, but it has a lot of information and a lot of meaning and import for us today, <clears throat> as it did for them as they heard it firsthand from Christ. Uh, and again, it seems a little strange to us not being farmers or shepherds, at least to me it does, uh, to try to get my head around it. Now we know, we, we hear about sheep, we hear about sheep all the time that we're the sheep, and that we're, we have a shepherd and that, <clears throat> but goats, the part of the goats, it, it's kind of interesting and you have to, you have to kind of picture this. Now, forget everything else you, you hear, you've heard about in, in the Bible about goats. Let's focus on Matthew 25 and what Christ says about them here in comparison to sheep. He gives us both. He, he gives both a warning to us and it's also encouragement that he gives to us, uh, if we stay the course and endure, as he told us in Matthew 24, 13. So both encouragement and a warning. It's a stirred action to endure to the end and to stay focused on the kingdom of God. If we fail to do so, our, our end is going to be disastrous and uh, we'll be a goat and lumped in with Satan and his demons in the lake of fire, as we'll see here. So let's read Matthew 25, 31. <clears throat> uh, 31 to 33 to start. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Very important. The right shows that uh, there's some honor there. There's some, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's on the good side. The goats are on the left, which is uh, dishonor. So these sheep and goats are together at this point. Up to this point, they're together. At this point, they get separated. Very important. Uh, and I, in a lot of the research that I did, People were, uh, they were, they were all over the board about when this happened. Some thought it was 70 AD. Some thought it was, uh, you know, at the beginning of the millennium. Uh, but we're going to see that, uh, first of all, where they are, uh, they, these are spirit, spirit beings are coming before, or they're going to be changed, first fruits, the church. When it says all people, uh, again, prophetically, nations and people, um, you have to go back and take a look at that, but uh, it's referring to the entire world. So everybody's going to get an opportunity to understand the truth, and God is going to give them that opportunity to make a choice as to whether they are a sheep or a goat. Now, the, again, the right side designates a place of honor. Christ sits on the right hand of, of God the Father, and the left side is not where you want to be. So who are these sheep and goats of Matthew 25? Who is it referring to? What is their fate? 
do the sheep and the goats pertain to us today? And if so, which are we? So let's read and go on and see what God says about the sheep and the goats. See what, it, it, what we can learn about that and it, how it can help us in our journey toward the kingdom of God, as well as especially our relationships. So you remember Matthew 22, 34, 5, and 6. It talks about loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. Okay, that's very important. That's the, that's the hard part. So it goes on in Matthew 25, 34 through 36. Go ahead and read there. It says, then the king will stay, say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. Now we can see in Romans 8, 14, 15, 16, and other places where it talks about the inheritance of the sons of God. The kingdom, your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Before the foundation of the earth, this plan for mankind was begun and designed and put into place by Jesus Christ and God the Father. <clears throat> the Word, the Logos, and the Father, the Almighty, the Eternal One. Now, here are the things that, why the, these that are on the right are blessed and have an inheritance and will enter into a relationship with God. Here's what they do. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. And I want you to think about these. It's more than just the physical. It is the physical. It's very important. Christ said, you'll, you know, if, if you've done it to me, if one of these leaves, you've done it to me, he says here. So it's also the spiritual aspect of it. How do you feed people? How do you give them? What did Christ do with the woman at the well? He fed her the truth. He gave her information that was pertaining to eternal life. So I was hungry. And certainly the world is hungry. And you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. And remember the woman at the well, it was holy, the Holy Spirit, rivers of living water. And you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Hospitality. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.10 says, talks about the woman. She has a reputation for doing good works. Has, now the good, again, is God in, inspired. It's not her works. She has shown hospitality, and she's cared for the afflicted. This is the one on the right, <clears throat> the sheep. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. And the, the reference there in, in all throughout the Bible is, is talking about uh, the righteous clothing, giving them a connection and a relationship with God. And through Jesus Christ, you're seen and in, in righteousness is imputed to you. You have the robes, the white robes, the righteousness, uh, the clothing. And I was sick and you looked after me. <clears throat> James 1.27 talks about pure and undefiled religion before God. And the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world, away from the world. We are called out of the world. We're to be part, not part of the world, but we're in the world, aren't we? But the, what God wants us to do is be a light to the world and salt. And that's how we get on the right side. That's how we become a sheep. Isaiah 61, 1, we follow Christ and all he did. And his example, the very first thing he talked about when he came into the synagogue, when he began his ministry, is Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me <clears throat> because the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. There's the food. He set me to bind up the brokenhearted, to take care of those that mourn and are sick and uh, many, many things uh, that cause a broken heart. Many things that happen in the world, uh, people are not happy, and we have something to give them that brings them hope and helps them uh, with abundant living physically as well as spiritually in the future. Uh, to preach the gospel to the poor, he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to open the prisons to those who are bound. You know, and, and, and the sins that we have, they weight us down, they put us in prison, they bind us, they keep us bound. But the, but the truth gives us liberty, gives us freedom. 
to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all that mourn. Comfort all that mourn. That's showing that we are followers of Jesus Christ. We're imitating him, that we are being changed to become like Christ, to have his mind, to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. It's very important. And we then, as we've been given grace, we live under grace. Uh, that's, you know, we all understand in this uh, fellowship what that, that means and that we then are gracious to other people and giving that to them. <clears throat> so that's what he wants us to do. We, that's what Christ did. And in order to be sheep on the right-hand side, these are things we need to do. And he is our chief shepherd, isn't he? So here we see those who are on the right side, the sheep, have the follow, following, those following characteristics Christ wants us to have. We can read through uh, so many places in the Bible. There's the blessings and the cursings theme that runs throughout the Bible. So sheep care, basically sheep care. They love one another. They love others in the flock and out of the flock. <clears throat> now, a couple things that, uh, that I found in, in researching this, and it's kind of interesting. You, you, you watch these traits that sheep and goats have and apply them to people. Sheep, and I think, I know God did that for a reason, so that in the analogies that, is, that he makes is for teaching purposes. Sheep are highly social, highly social and relational. They're gregarious. Uh, they're great mothers, loving, nurturing mothers. Sheep form strong bonds within the flock and friendships among those around them. And they can identify up to 50 so they know their shepherd. They know their shepherd's voice in John 10. It talks about that. <clears throat> they can re re recognize different facial and emotional expressions, such as fear and contentment. And they have many different vocalization, communication skills, where they, they're, they're very vocal and co they communicate a lot with one another. And they, they tend to be more content to stay with the herd. They're more content to be in that, that group. Matter of fact, that's where they gain their... Okay, so they tend to be more content to stay with the herd. Now, this, this is a perfect description of those who are here in, in uh, Matthew 25, the sheep that are on the right side of the throne. They care for the flock. In fact, they display their love for, G for Jesus and for others, for Christ and others, by showing their love to fellow man. Christ told us that, didn't he? John 13, uh, <clears throat> 34, a new commandment, he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another in the same way that I have loved you. That is how you are to love one another. He shows us, he came before to show us the way, the truth and the life. And we imitate that, we all understand that. By this you shall, shall everyone know that you are my disciples, that you're my sheep, if you love one another. And he, several others, his entire ministry was that theme and also the kingdom of god which is by the way comprised of sheep <laughs> sheep have love for one another we've gone through all those and uh, again they're very dependent on the shepherd hebrews 13 uh, 1 through 3 says let brotherly love be present brotherly love you know we say that and it's just kind of we kind of got gloss over it what does that mean how do you show that? How do you emulate that? How do you put that in practice? Brotherly love be present among you continually, even in the hard times. Do not forget to show hospitality. For this is some, for by this some have unknowingly welcomed angels as guests. Be mindful of prisoners as if you were imprisoned with them. And think of those who are suffering. Again, you know, the prisoners, those are the actual prisoners, but also in other ways. And think of those who are suffering afflictions. We talked a little bit about that last night. As if yourself were in the body, their body. So em uh, sympathy and empathy for their affliction. We want to become sheep on the right side of God on his, in his throne and his family forever in that relationship. So these are the sheep. Guess what? They're collected at the last trump. And people have trouble with this, understanding when that is. 
uh, again, like I said, I did a lot of research on it and they were all over the board. But they're collected at the last trump on Pentecost as first fruits. Matthew 24 tells us that in verse 30 through 31 it says, and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn <clears throat> and they shall see the son of man coming upon the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. We're going to see that it, uh, the day of Pentecost will come here very shortly. We'll be anticipating that, but also this day much more. And then we'll be sorted and separated and put on the right hand side of Christ. So let's think about this. Now, before before we think that we're anything great, that's calling, that we're, that we're elect, we're special, we are in God's eyes, but we're really nothing, nothing at all. We need to remember where we started, don't we? <clears throat> we started out in the world. We were all goats. Think about it. Were you a sheep before you were called? <laughs> so we were part of the world, weren't we? Carnality and enmity against God. Romans 8, verse 6 and 7, it says you were carnally minded. Uh, you were, But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So we, we need to have understanding as we deal with one another that maybe some of those goat traits are popping out <laughs> we need to tuck them back in maybe you know a horn or a beard or something's popping out on, on one another and and we need to be patient and merciful as as uh, roger was talking about last night but once called we repent of who we were and who we are when we bat we are we are then baptized and given the holy spirit and we're able to begin this change, this change to a new creature, this change from a goat to a sheep. Second uh, Corinthians five seventeen talks about this. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation, a sheep. The old things have passed away. Being a goat, they should be gone. Behold, all things have become new. And then this metamorphosis begins, metamorphosis in Rom Romans uh, 12 too. Do not conform yourself to this world. You've come out of the world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind in order that you may prove what is well-pleasing and good and the perfect will of God to become a sheep, to become like Christ, to have his mind. We do find occasionally that we fall back into actions and attitudes, don't we? That are goat-like and have we have to then repent of them. Uh, 2 Peter 2.20 talks about that. Okay, this is for everyone, all of us, me, everybody. This is, this is our calling. This is what we need to examine. We need to be on this every day, every day. Verse 20 in 2 Peter 2. For if, after escaping the moral defilements of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that's how, we didn't do it on our own, the Father drew us, Jesus Christ, they again become entangled in them. You know, becoming like a goat again, and are overcome. The final end is worse than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it, turn back from the holy commandment that was delivered to them. You see the warning? But also, there's a great hope. There's a great future. But there's a warning. You know, we have to, he talked about in Matthew 4, uh, 24, 13, that we have to endure. Endure to the end. Hang in there. Stick with it. It's a, it's a marathon race. It's not a sprint. We have to hang in there and keep going, no matter what happens. Now, who are the goats? We see the sheep. Who are the goats? It could be us as well. We just saw that. If we do not stay the course and fight the good fight, as Paul talked about, 
Goats are exactly opposite of sheep. Instead of caring for their fellow man, they despise them. They only, they only care for themselves. They're self-centered. They're inward. They think of themselves. Not what can I do for you, but what can you do for me? And how, you know, they're oblivious to anyone in need. They are self-centered. They're proud and vain. And we're going to look at several, several other traits. And we're going to actually look at some of those that have been pers um, personified, if you will for us and kept in, the, in, in God's word for us to look at. Look at what, the, uh, what, what, what he continues to say here in Matthew uh, 25, 41. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say to those on his left, the goats, depart from me, you who are cursed, into where? Eternal fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Boy, we don't want that. <laughs> for I was hungry. Now look, look what he just, look at, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not, did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. This world needs that. They need the truth. They need to know about the truth. And you did not invite me in. We're not hospitable. I needed clothes and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in a prison, in prison. I was bound by my, by the sins that, that, that dragged me down. And you did not look after me. They did not do any of the things that the sheep do. Their reward is opposite of what the sheep have. They're on the left side. Now this again is a warning for us and it's also encouragement to see what the reward is at the end. Isn't that encouraging? Isn't that exciting? And we're our brother's keeper. We are we are to help and, and bear one another's burdens and, and we do it in love. And there are times when we need to come confront sin and things so that that person who's in that sin will not sprout horns and a beard and end up being a goat and end up on the left-hand side because we love them. We don't want to see them that happen to them. <clears throat> if you're a true sheep, we have to examine ourselves constantly and daily. Okay, some of the natural traits of goats. This is interesting. Goats are naturally curious and often get into mischief and trouble as a result. Do you ever, you ever see someone that's always in trouble? someone's life that they can never seem to get out of difficulty they're always in difficulty nothing seems to go well for them hmm why is that you know and some you know it's not always somebody else you're not always a victim <clears throat> sometimes you are goats tend to be more independent now the independence is okay when you're under a a bad teacher, a false prophet, or a, 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 an abusive leader, abusive, okay? And we've seen, in our history, we've seen those things, and it's time to leave those when they're when it's like that. Remove yourself from where they're not teaching the truth and go get back to the body. And in that way that you are being, you're taking a step. You're being independent of that false environment, that toxic environment. Goats tend to be more independent. Now, here's another problem. They're headstrong and they're obstinate. No, okay, ask yourself, am I like this? The, intent, the, the, the normal thing is to say, boy, I know a lot of people like that. Oh, wait a minute. You know, when you point the finger, let's see how it goes. Let's see. See how many fingers come back at you? <laughs> so think, think about it. Obstinate, opinionated. Some people on social media, they start chat rooms and they, they, they want to discuss the opinions, their opinions. They want to uh, talk about it. They want to complain. Basically, what they're doing is complaining and gossiping, sowing discord and division. But it's their opinion, opinionated. And they're vocal in that, in complaining. They're, they're rash. They don't think first. They don't stop. Shut, shut this. Open these. 
and let it process in here where the Holy Spirit's supposed to be. Let it marinate in the Holy Spirit before it comes out here. And when you do that, most of the time, it never comes out here. Or when it does, it comes out with grace and love. Rude, rash, ready to fight at a drop of a hat. Well, you're not going to do that to me. You, gonna, you don't know who you're dealing with. Disagreeable. Always disagreeable. <laughs> troublemakers and busybodies and it talks about look up busybodies and troublemaker okay these are the goats goats don't want anyone telling them what to do and they don't listen they're always in trouble they're always off somewhere else and goats seem to want to forage their browsers uh, sheep are grazers Goats are browsers. They want to forage on their own. And they want to get their own food. They want to go on the internet and sort of see, uh, read this book and read that book. And I got something to tell you guys. Did you know about this? <gasps> really? Wow. That's amazing. They forage on their own. And I don't need a shepherd. I could do it myself. And they'll eat anything. See the connection? Sheep eat grass. They drink fresh, clear water. Goats browse on anything that you'll throw at them. Anything they can find. Tin cans, anything. Weeds, trash, trash. Garbage in, garbage out. Finally, in verse 40, Jesus says, he mentions, he says, The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of these least of these brothers and sisters of mine you did it for me least okay uh look at first corinthians 120 uh 126 and 7 where it talks about who's called to we'll read through that we don't we won't do that here but look at look at who who, who we talk, we're talking about we're the least you know uh we're we're nothing we're absolutely nothing. And we understand that and we realize that. And once we understand that and realize that, then the slate is clean and the ground is fertile to begin planting and growing a crop of fruit, spiritual fruit. But if we think we're something, there's no room for growth. You don't need Jesus Christ. You don't need a shepherd. You don't need the truth. You got your own. That's what a goat is. So the comparison given in Matthew, given in Matthew 25 between the sheep and the goats is for us, isn't it? <clears throat> We're either sheep, if we follow the chief shepherd, eat what he feeds us. Again, remember, he's the bread of life. Rely and trust on him for our needs, for our security and protection. And then emulate that and show love and care for our fellow man in their needs of everything, physical and spiritual. Be willing and ready to help wherever we can. That's a sheep, caring for one another. If we don't want to fall in the category of a goat and cast, as we saw, into the lake of fire with Satan and his demons to be burned up, you know, then we need to examine and think. It's serious, isn't it? Very serious. So how to them do we follow the example set for us by Christ and become sheep-like brethren? Uh, one passage, we'll just read one passage here that kind of, I don't know, sort of epitomizes or is sort of the capstone of that. 1 John 3, 14 through 18. <clears throat> and John was the, uh, the apostle, you know, it says the apostle of love. He spoke about love a lot, mostly. 14, we know that we have passed from death, where were we? From death into life because we love the brethren, and I'm adding this, and the truth. We have a love for the truth and love for the brethren. The, ones who, the one who does not love his brother is dwelling in death. The one who does not love his brother is dwelling in death. You know, we heard something last night about two that have been at odds for a long time. Everyone who hates his brother 
is a murderer. And that can be explained very easily. And you know that no murderer has eternal life dwelling in him. So in other words, the Holy Spirit's not activated. It's not active. It's not fired up. Verse 16, by this very act, we have known the love of God because he laid down his life for, our, for us. And what are we supposed to do? And we ourselves are to lay down our lives for the brethren. And our life right now, no, we don't have a lot of people being martyred right now. And there are Christians around the world being martyred. But we lay down our lives through our time and service and giving, being selfless, not self-centered, but selfless. What can I do for you? Verse 17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his feelings of compassion, hopefully he has them, and he shuts them up. How can the love of God be dwelling in him? 18, my little children, we should not love in word, nor with our tongues, but rather we should love in deed and in truth. And it says in Colossians 3, 17, do everything in word and deed to God or to Christ to glorify him. So what does a goat and a sheep situation look like in the church of God? Do you know any of those? I mean, have you ever seen anything like that? <clears throat> well, we have kept in uh, the record in the word of God an example of that. So let's turn to 3 John 3. And it's for our benefit. It's for our growth. And it's uh, a warning for us. And there's a lot to learn in this section. John, 3 John 3, <clears throat> 1 through 8. It describes what sheep in a congregation look like. And it's, it describes what a goat in a congregation looks like or in a fellowship. Easily spotted, easily seen. Not that you're judging. You're not judging. Judge righteous judgment. But by the fruits, if the fruits are apparent and they're continuous, then you can make an evaluation. You don't condemn that person, but you make an evaluation. And then we have direct directives from God as to what to do in love, to care for the brethren, to care for our brothers and sisters, the other sheep, to watch out for them, to say, hey, there's a wolf. Shepherd, there's a wolf. And then in love, deal with that situation. And sometimes there's, you know, there's no reconciliation and sometimes there is. So those are the things that need to be done within a fellowship. We're going to see this. Describes what, one through eight, describes what a sheep in the congregation looks like. Gaius. Gaius is a great example. And Demetrius later on in the chapter. It says, the elder to Gaius, in other words, John is writing to Gaius, the beloved, whom I love in truth, and he was walking in truth, John was, and Gaius was. Those two connected as one of the same mind. Beloved, I personally am praying for you that <laughs> I personally <laughs> am praying for you that in all respects you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul is prospering. For I rejoiced exceedingly at the coming of the brethren who testified of you in truth. Another day they brought a report of Gaius to, to John in truth, even how you are walking in truth. Okay, is that can be said of us? Can that be said of me? Can that be said of you? Are you hospitable? Are you walking in truth? All that that all that that means. And we we gloss again. We gloss over that. What does that mean? What is the truth? What are we to do? What's laid out in the in the in the Bible and God's word for us? How, what are the operating uh, directives for us? Verse four. I do not have any greater joy than this, than these testimonies that I am hearing, that my children are walking in the truth. Verse five. Beloved, you are faithfully practicing, 
practicing. Whatever you have been doing for the brethren, remember what the sheep did? And for strangers in and out of the flock, not just in your little fellowship group. And then those other guys, we don't, you know, no, it's, it's an attitude. It's a, it's a, it's a lifestyle. It's a mindset. It's a heart, heart and mind. Verse six, who have testified of your love before the church, you will do, do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. And he says that on a, for a reason. The goats, the goat in this case, is not doing this. Because the sake, for the sake of his name, they went forth preaching and taking nothing. In other words, for Christ's sake, for the gospel, for the kingdom of God, they went forth and they didn't take anything. God took care of them. God, Christ was a shepherd and he cared for the sheep. Okay, taking nothing from the Gentiles. For this cause, we are personally obligated to receive those who do such service in order that we may be fellow workers in the truth. Okay, now John begins to talk about the problem. He talks about a goat in the congregation. Diotrephes. We've all heard that. Diotrephes. I don't know if you've studied about Diotrephes, but this is very interesting. Try to put Diotrephes today in a fellowship group. If we ran into Diotrephes, would we recognize it? Would we identify that? And would we sound the alarm? And would we do as Christ wants us to do? And I'll show you that here in a minute. We talked a little bit about that last night. There is a difference. There's a difference between a Matthew 18 situation and a desperate situation where you need to, you know, say, hey, there's a there's a wolf over here. Help, you know, hey, hey, let's do something about that before it hurts anyone. Shows what, uh, you know, this, what he's talking about, about diatrophy shows that this can happen to a member who does not care for the flock, but rather is self-serving and proud and arrogant and wanting to, to be noticed, wanting to be acknowledged, wanting everyone else to, to know that they are, they have something, that they have knowledge and they have information that's maybe is a new truth, maybe something that you haven't thought about before. So verse nine, he starts to talk about diatrophies. There's not a lot written about him, but you can read between the lines here. I wrote to the church, but diatrophies, the one who loves to be chief, among them wants to be chief among them does not accept us now isn't that interesting john just spent the first eight chapters talking about receiving and and hospitality and going back and forth one-minded loving one another well this individual won't receive those that bring the truth uh there's a reason for that because of this very thing if i come I will call him to account for the actions that is practicing. He is practicing with, now get this, evil words, maliciously berating who? John and the others that were with him. Berating them. He's not satisfied with these things, for he himself neither receives the brethren, nor does he permit those who wish to receive the brethren. But he forbids them and cast them out of the church or cast them out of his group. He's got a following. He's got a select group. And he, anybody else that brings that doctrine in or the truth in or calls him on it, diatrophies, he's going to cast out. You can't be part of this group anymore. You're bad. You're out. So let's take a closer look here. He loved to have the preeminence over the brethren. Okay, there's only one other place in the New Testament that that word is used. Now there's one in Ecclesiastes that's talking about animals, man and animals and all that were all the same. But there's two places. One is in Colossians 1, 17 through 18. And we're gonna read that. This is what he wanted. Verse 17. And he is before all, and by him all things subsist. Whoa, is that Diotrephes? No. 
He is before all, and by him all things subsist. And he is the head of the body, the church, <clears throat> who is the beginning, the firstborn among the dead. And so, so that in all things he himself might hold what? The preeminence. That's what Diotrephes wanted. Hey, does that sound familiar? Do we know of another place in the Bible, a couple places, that someone wanted the preeminence over the brethren? The word preeminence is proteo. P-R-O-T-E-U-O. -E it's from protos. We've heard Fred talk about that. The definition is to have first place. Diotrephes wanted to be first in the fellowship. He wanted everyone to see him as first. Now, who else did that? Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Satan wanted the preeminence. He wanted to be God. So when we do these things as goats, who, who, are, we, who are we of? Satan, our father? What did he say? John, uh, Christ say in John 8, 8, 44. Okay, verse 12, Isaiah 14. How are you fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? When this happens, it weakens the fellowship. It weakens our brethren. It weakens these sheep, and they're affected. There's put a, the stumbling block is put into them. The, the atmosphere is toxic. And it was a toxic environment in the fellowship where Gaius, where Gaius and Demetrius and Diotrephes were. For you have said in your heart, in your heart, this is what he was. In his mind, in his heart. What, what kind of heart are we to have? I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the Most High. Wow. God gave him earth to govern. He wasn't happy with that, was he? He's a God of this world. He was not cast back down. Christ came to qualify to, to take over and he will when he comes back. But Satan wanted the throne of God, and he wanted to be exalted above the stars. You see that in Revelation 12. He wanted to rule over the angels. He was, here, here are his, his, his traits, his character traits that were part of his heart. Greed, vanity, selfishness, self-exaltation, pride. What did it do? After he watched this for a while, a root of bitterness formed and festered in him, and it broke out into an action. And then he didn't just do it on his own then. He recruited others to join in this coup, to agree with him that the father was bad. We're victims. He's over there, and we're here, and we're being victimized. This is not right. So he got some to join his coup, and if they didn't agree with him, he was going to cast them out, kick them out. They couldn't be part of the group anymore. Spreading discontent. Accusations. Who's the, the accuser? Division. Speaking evil of dignitaries of John. Speaking evil of him. How did this fellowship get into this mess? With diatrophies. How did it happen? It didn't start out that way. John, or we don't know who, but John probably planted that congregation or that fellowship. And they started out with the truth. And I'm sure they started out, everybody happy, everybody sheep. But a little leaven leavens the whole lump, doesn't it? And diatrophies with the attitude and the heart and the mind and the influence of Satan, Caused a big problem. He got a following, got them, and worked on them, worked on them, worked on them. How did Satan get a third of the angels? How long did that take? I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure he didn't do it overnight. John 3.10 says, 1 John 3.10 says, By this standard are manifest the children of God 
and the children of the devil. Everyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, and neither is the one who does not love his brother. Now, Diotrephes didn't love his brother, did he? He looked like he looked the part, but he was tuned in to Satan. He wanted it all and would cast out anyone who defiled him or spoke and, and uh, evil against him or didn't trust him. You know what the word Diotrephes means? <laughs> Reared by Zeus, Ju <laughs> Jupiter. Reared by, in other words, the son of Satan. Who did Zeus represent? Who did Jupiter represent? That's what Diotrephes means. He maybe maybe he was an aristocrat. You know, he was maybe he had a lot of money, had a family lineage and heritage. Maybe he was uh, he thought he was somebody special, and he had a desire to be seen, of course, and acknowledged and known. And maybe he was a smart guy. Maybe he was a good communicator, a good speaker, thought of himself as somebody great, higher and better than any other, and especially the Apostle John. Wow. Maybe even Jesus Christ and maybe even the Father. I don't know. He lorded it over that little congregation, that little fellowship, and he gained a following. Now, there's the problem. He gained a following. That's how it became a mess. It wasn't acted on. Some there listened to him and support, supported his sedition. And he cast out those who would dare to disagree and call him out for his evil warning the church of the wolf in their present presence. Some people will stand up against the evil they see and they will warn the shepherd, hey, there's a problem. Well, what, what does Satan do to them? What does he do, typically? This is age old. He turns it on them and makes them look like the bad guy because they would dare to challenge him. He probably looked the part, he was able to speak, he looked and sounded good. He was ambitious, proud, unhospitable, he was disrespectful of apostolic authority and rebellious. What is stubbornness and rebellion in First Samuel 15? It's as witchcraft. And what is, where does witchcraft come from? Satan. If you have a stubbornness or you're rebellious or you're independent and you don't need anybody, you don't need, basically you're saying you don't need Jesus Christ. You're doing like Satan did. You are a son and a, a, a child of uh, disobedience. Uh, so we have to think about this. We have to examine ourselves constantly. We want to be sheep, not goats. How did this get that way? He says, beloved, do not imitate that which is evil. Rather, imitate that which is good. Imitators. Ephesians, oh, it's Ephesians 5. Uh, again, Romans 12, the one who practices good is of God, but the one who practices evil has not seen God. We have received testimony from everyone on behalf of Demetrius, verse 12, and from the truth itself. That's what you, that's what was the litmus test. Demetrius was going against Christ. Demetrius was going against the truth, not John, not Gaius, not Demetrius. He was going against the head of the church. Serious stuff. We received testimony on behalf of Demetrius and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness that you know that our witness is true. I had many things to write to you. Now get this. But now I will not write them with pen and ink. In other words, I'm not going to put it down on paper to be used against me. No, I'm going to come to him face to face. For I hope to see you shortly, and I will speak with you face to face. <laughs> Peace be unto you. And, and I would, he, I'm sure he did it in a loving way, but he was firm. He was unmovable. 
John was unmovable. He had seen Christ, he had walked with him, been taught by him. He was unmovable. Peace be to you. Christ said, my peace I leave with you. And then he finally says, um, our friends salute you. Salute the friends by name. In other words, know them. Just like the sheep can remember 50 couples and 50 people and the shepherd. We are to salute our friends by name. A warning to, di to diatrophies of the world, isn't it? The diatrophies is, uh, of the world. Those in our, our body of Christ around the world, wherever they may be. Romans 2, 3 through uh, 6 says, Now you think, now do you think yourself, old man, do you think yourself, old man, whoever is judging those who commit such things, and you are practicing them yourself, that you shall escape the judgment of God? You're going to be a goat. What happens to the goat on the left-hand side? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance? and long-suffering. See, God is forbearing and long-suffering, and he's kind. Not knowing the graciousness of God leads you to repentance. That's the hope. It's not to, you know, beat anyone up or be mean to anybody, but allow the graciousness of God to lead you to repentance. But you, <laughs> according to your own hardness and unrepentant heart, are storing up wrath for yourself against the day of wrath and revelation of God's righteous judgment who will render to each one according to his own works. Serious stuff, isn't it? Peter gives us the proper way to become a sheep or a goat. I think this is, kind of says it all. First Peter 5. 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4. Feed the flock of God that is among you. Remember, feed me, I was hungry. Exercise oversight. How? You know, God set this up. There's a reason why he did. There's a reason why he came as the chief shepherd in love and kindness and peace and all the things. Comfort. Why? Not, not by compulsion but willingly, not in fondness of dishonest gain, but with eager attitude. We're not trying to be, if you're helping someone, you're not trying to get something for that. You're doing it because your heart leads you and guides you. The Holy Spirit leads you to show love and care and concern for people. Not as <clears throat> exercising lordship over your possessions, but by being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd is manifest, you shall receive an unfading eternal crown of glory on the right side of God as sheep. Now, even as bad as this is, God shows us that we are to be long-suffering. That we are to be patient, having mercy and forgiveness when repentance is shown. When repentance is shown, but being firm in the face of evil and protecting the flock, and protecting our brothers, and caring for them, and watching out for them. Why does God wait to the end to separate them, the sheep from the goats? Why does he wait to the end? Well, I think it's answered in 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, the Lord is not delaying his promise of his coming, as some in their own words, in their own minds reckon delay. Rather, he is long-suffering toward us, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's how we should be. However, the, Lord, the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night in which the heaven itself shall disappear with a mighty roar, and the elements shall pass away, burning with intense heat, and the earth and the works in it shall be burned up. Where are we going to be? Since all these things are going to be destroyed, all the physical are going to be destroyed, 
what kind of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, and I might add, toward our brothers and toward others. God's character is that God never rushes to judgment. He says in Ezekiel 33, say to them, I, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their way and live and become sheep. Join the family. Join the fellowship of like-minded loving brethren. God in his great love and mercy waits as long as possible to judge those who are goats because his heart is to give them as much time as possible to allow for repentance. He does. This does not mean that he won't eventually bring judgment, but he's patient before he does. Uh, Jesus identifies who are the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. I think we can see that now. We see through an example and through the traits of the goats and the sheep. It's simple. Who are they? The sheep care. The goats don't. It could simply be that the mark of your love for God is how you love the brethren. Christ tells us that many places. And your fellow man a selfless, loving and caring Christ-centered servant is who he's looking for. That's who the sheep are. Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd, loved all and set the example for his sheep. A couple last scriptures here. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, Paul tells us that love suffers long. Read the whole chapter. It's kind. Love does not envy like a Diotrephes. Love does not parade itself, have a stage to be seen. You know, you can tell when people are like that. And you can tell when people speak from the heart. You can tell when people are theatrical. Parading themselves is not puffed up. And read, go, go ahead and read the rest of that. I won't finish that. Colossians 3, 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, that's who we are. We're not anything great. Not anything, but we are precious in the eyes of God. Holy and beloved by the Father in Jesus Christ. Here's what we're to do. Here's what identified those sheep. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in the difficult times, Forgiving one another, being ready to forgive. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Now there's your personal Matthew 18. There's your situation. And that covers most things. If you have two people who have God's Holy Spirit, those get taken care of at the lowest level. At the face-to-face, -face, over here in the con You don't even know about it. Very seldom do they ever escalate. It's when you have a goat in the, in the middle of the mess that they escalate. If we do these things, we will hear at the end of Pentecost and the Sea of Glass, we're going to hear this, and then I'll, I, I'll end with this. Matthew 25, 23. Matthew 25, verse 23. The Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant, because you were faithful over a few things, I will set you over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. 